Praise God. We thank you. We praise you. We magnify your awesome name. God is awesome. Amen. We just thank him for him being God and him being God by himself. Amen. We just glorify him for everything. Amen. The thing that I want to talk about tonight is spiritual warfare. We've been dealing with spiritual warfare for a while. And I really want to go into spiritual warfare. Amen. And I want to go into what God is saying to us today. Amen. And so let's bow our heads and pray. Father, right now in the mighty, awesome name of Jesus, God, we just glorify and praise your magnificent name, God. We magnify you, God. We bless you. We bless you for just being the King of kings and the Lord of lords. We bless you, God, for just making a way out of nowhere, God. We magnify you, God, for opening doors, God, that we couldn't see, God, for just... God, just being the King of kings and being the Lord of lords, being the entity that protects us, God, and builds us up, God, and, and blesses us, God. And we just thank you, God. Father God, move in a mighty way today, God. Move in a way, God, that blows our natural mind. Father God, we understand that the enemy has tried his best to stop what you're trying to do, to stop the power of God, to stop the move of God, to stop us from utilizing our God-given weapons, God, to, to destroy and bring his kingdom down. But Father, we thank you because we are about to win. We're about to win in every aspect of our life. We're about to win, God, in our households, God. We're about to win on our jobs. Father. We're about to win in our communities, Father. We're about to win, God, all over the place, God, and it's about to be a shout of victory, God, that the men and women of God have entered into the place, God, and it's about to make the enemy scared, God. We thank you, we praise you, we magnify your awesome name. It is in the awesome name of Jesus. God, as we go through this Bible study, God, allow our minds to be illuminated, God. Allow our spirits to be refreshed, God. Allow our souls to be revived, God. Allow us to be all that you called us to be. Allow us to walk in our destiny, God. Allow us to allow the knowledge of God to change our course of action, God, to change our lives, God, to motivate us to be all that you called us to be. In the mighty awesome name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. You know, God was really talking to my heart about us being all that he called us to be, God. Not just part of it, not just a little, but I want us to be every single thing that God called us to be. I'm talking about, I want you to just walk in the glory of God. I want you to talk the glory of God. I want you to move in the magnificence of God. I want the glory of God to just reign on your life. I want God to just do a thing in you. Amen. I just want you to see the magnificence of God. Amen. Amen. And so I just want to thank God for what he's saying in our lives and and I want to go back to the whole armor of God. And I want you to remember all the things that we've talked about through this series. One of the first things we talked about was the fact that praise is a weapon. Man, there's times where we just get into a praise. And that praise in and of itself allows us to have victory in every aspect, in every area of our lives. Not only is praise a weapon, don't you understand that prayer is a weapon? Don't you understand that a lot of times I, can, I don't defeat you in, on my feet, I defeat you on my knees. I, I defeat you by praying the will of God in my life, by praying God's grace in my life, by praying God to do exceeding and abundantly all around me. And my prayer is going to change things. But I just pray, we're doing something right now as a spiritual weapon. We're on a 40-day fast as a church, a corporate fast. There's times where you individually do some things. Then there's times where you corporately do some things. And so we're corporately going on a fast and saying, God, we're about to tear some stuff down. There's been some things that have been running rampant in our lives. It's not going to run rampant anymore because we're not only are we praying, not only are we praising, but we're fasting. And those three things are very powerful weapons that God has. And God has really allowed those weapons to just change the course of our life. Don't you know that the word is also a weapon? The Bible talks about that. And we're going to kind of go back into it a little bit tonight. But I thank God for the word being a weapon. Amen. And then there's these weapons right here that, that we've talked about throughout the course of this lesson. Amen. It says, and I love it, you know, this scripture we read all the time, Ephesians 6, 14. It says, stand therefore. Having your loins girded about with truth. Truth. That's a weapon. Amen. And having on the breastplate of righteousness. Righteousness is, is a weapon. Amen. And your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. So the gospel of peace 
is a weapon, amen? And so we got to understand that these things are weapons. It says above all, I love this, because the shield of faith is so essential and important inside of the weapon. And not only the shield, right? And I told somebody, I'm going to share with you guys, but I told somebody, see, your shield not only can be a defensive weapon, but every now and then, the, the army start using the shield to throw some stuff in, to throw some blows, because the shield of faith will knock some stuff out of your way, amen? And so you've got to learn how to utilize the shield of faith. You've got to learn how to walk in faith. Faith is a walk. Faith is a journey. Faith is the process that we get to what God wants us to get to. The way that I'm going to get there is by faith. Not only am I going to walk by faith, I'm going to live by faith. How am I going to get all the stuff that God said? I'm going to do it by faith. How am I going to forgive people? I'm going to do it by faith. How am I going to let stuff go? I'm going to do it by faith. How am I going to allow God to move? I'm going to do it by faith. How is God going to work in my life? It's going to be by faith. I can't do it by self. I can't do it. I don't understand it. I can't allow it to happen in my life. So now I got to start walking in faith. A lot of times we we'll look at situations and say, I can't see that happening. I can't see myself doing it. I can't see that going. I can't see it. That's why you do it by faith. Amen. You're not doing it by sight. You're doing it by faith. And so we walk by faith and not by sight. We don't walk by what we know. We walk by faith. Faith is so important. Bible says that without faith, it's impossible to please God. And so you got to understand that I'm not going to be able to give God what he wants outside of faith. I got to walk in faith. Abel, Cain, Abel walked in faith. Cain walked in disbelief. Cain walked outside of faith and thought he was going to be able to please God. He wasn't able to please God because he didn't have enough faith to do what God said do. A lot of times we think it takes faith to, to move mouth. It takes faith to, to, to live right. It takes faith to walk in righteousness. It takes faith to love people. It takes faith to be able to forgive people. It takes faith to be able to let things go. It takes faith to be able to do the will of God and what God has for us to do. It takes this thing called faith. And so we got to walk by faith. We got to live by faith. We got to allow faith to be that weapon that we need. It's faith that's going to bring us to where we need to go, right? And so the enemy is flowing as far as dark. But today we're going to talk about something that's just as important as faith, right? It's the helmet of salvation. So you got to understand that two things that are very important, right? It is that, that, that they want a body shot, right? They want to knock you out in the body. That knocks your wind out, right? Your vital organs are here. So your breastplate it, it, of righteousness, it, it kind of protects all of this, right? And so your vital organs and your breast and your heart and all that. But then now you got to put on the helmet of salvation. Now, now the helmet of salvation is important because a head blow can be devastating. And so the enemy wants to knock you in your head. Now, what resides in your head? Your mind resides in your head. And so what happens is he wants to get after your mind. He wants to get after the thing that allows you to think. He does not want you to be able to walk in salvation he wants to change your mind. Can I preach real quick? The enemy wants to change your mind. Yes. And so if he can change your mind, if he can have you to think differently than you're supposed to think, then he can, he can really get you. So many times in Christianity, God gives us a way to think about things. He gives us what I call a, 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 a biblical perspective, a biblical worldview. But then the world comes in and says, it's not really like that. You don't really have to do that. Those people are okay. This is okay to do. It's all right to be. You can be whatever you want to be. You got a situation now that, that people believe that they can do whatever they want to do and, and think whatever they want to think and they still go into heaven. In fact, some people say, well, we're going we gonna to get a church that's just for us. I don't believe that, 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 that the church should be separated to the point where it's just for us. That don't mean that sometimes you might not have churches that, that have a certain cultural background or a certain uh, demographic. That's okay. But when that demographic says we're the only ones, that's the problem. And so when, you, when you're not welcome into the rest of the body of Christ, that's an issue. That's a problem. Something wrong with that. So, so you don't isolate yourself like we're going to have a church over here. You say, God, what you want us to do? How you want us to operate? How? Now, you can't make people come to your church, but you have a church that's open to whoever, right? Because they're going to come in all kind of ways, but they got to lead the way of God. Does that make sense? 
And so God is really trying to give us some stuff. And I really want us to get that God wants us to think the right way. But the enemy wants to take our head. Go ahead and if you got your Bibles, turn to Philippians, the second chapter, um, the fifth verse. So it's actually only a couple pages over for most people, right? Philippians, the second chapter, the fifth verse. Here's what the word says. And we're not going to read everything that has something to do with this, but I want you to read this one. It says, let this mind be in you. Can I, can I hear? Let this mind be in you. God wants us to have a certain type of mindset, Amen. right? And so you got to understand something about a mindset. Where a mind is set, a body will follow. If a mind thinks he's great, the body will become great. If a mind thinks that it's not it's less than, the body will be less than. The Israelites said we are like grasshoppers in their eyes. And because of their mindset, they were never able to defeat the enemy. But because Caleb said we're well able to take the land. Eventually, when it was God's timing, Caleb and Joshua and the rest of the people that believed God and trusted God's word were able to take the land. Why? Because their mindset. A lot of people are still broke because they have a mindset that will not allow them to allow riches to come in their life, to allow blessings to come in their life. Now, I'm not saying you got to be all this because I, I, I'm, not a, I'm not in a position that you've got to be rich to be saved. But I'm not in a position that you got to be broke to be saved either. I'm saying that God allows blessings to come in our lives, but we have to not be in the position in our head to say, I'm going to stop that from coming to my life because I don't believe God can do it for me. God can do anything. God wants to bless me because he wants to bless the kingdom because I'm going to have the right mindset. Bible told Abraham, I blessed you to be a blessing. And our biggest problem is that we're not trying to be blessed to be a blessing. We're trying to bless to be a, uh, you know what I mean? We want to promote ourselves and we want to talk about how good we are and how, how much stuff we have. Sometimes you might be able to afford a million dollar home, but why not just go in here to get a $200,000 home and then be a blessing to the people of God? Be a blessing to the people out there. Be a blessing. Right? You don't have to live lavishly to live blessed. You don't have to gather all that stuff up for yourself and then, then, then you want more and more and more. And that becomes your God because you start loving the thing. God didn't say that riches we're evil, but he said the love of riches is evil. The mindset is we're doing this for God. We're, we're living for God. But I'm going to allow God to bless me any way he want to bless me. God, I love that song. It says, any way you bless me, I'll be satisfied. And so that's all we have to be in life. God, however you bless me, I'm going to be cool with it. I'm going to be good with it because the blessing of God is good. Amen. The blessing of God, you know, I love it because God does not, when he blesses us, it don't mess us up. It don't, it don't, it don't curse us. It don't hurt us. Amen. But it's good for us. Amen. It's always going to bless you to the point where everything's going to work out. Amen. So many times people, um, you know, they get a blessing in their life and it really hurts them. They get a new car, now they can't come to church anymore. They get a new house, now they won't invite people over the house anymore. They get new stuff, and now they acting like there's somebody that they weren't yesterday. Look, you, 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 you are in the same body you were in yesterday, so stop acting brand new. Stop acting like you're something different than you were. You're the same person. Same people that were able to come around me when I was young, same people able to come around me now. I don't care what I go and what I do. I love the people. I love my family. I love my friends. And they're going to always be my friends. Amen? I'm not going to get brand new. I can't hang around those type of people anymore. Uh, no, that's not me. That's, that shouldn't be you. That shouldn't be anybody. I'll tell you something. I don't care if, if it's a garbage man. I don't care if it's a bum. I don't care if it's somebody who's living on the street. I don't care if it's somebody who's homeless. I don't care if it's somebody who's in the presidential suite. I don't care if it's somebody who... If, every man is the same. I'm going to tell you about every man I've learned. Every man puts on his pants one leg at a time. And so guess what? You don't treat any of them different. All of them are men. Don't you treat a rich man bad because he's rich? And don't you treat a poor man bad because he's poor? That mind has to be righteous and right before God. Now watch this. It says, right? And it says in the fifth verse, it says, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. So it wants you to have the mind of Christ. Who being, the verse is Philippians, the second chapter, 
the fifth verse, Philippians, same, same chapter, same verse. Philippians, the, set, the um, second chapter, the fifth verse. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God. And so now he, 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 he's in the form of God, right? And, 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 and not only is he the form of God, he's equal to God, but he made himself of no reputation. See, if we had the power that Jesus had, we'd be the biggest and the baddest in the land. We get us a PR person and we make sure that it has been promoted correctly because when we step out, we want everybody to come and give us an almost like hail to the king. But Jesus didn't get all that. He was the king of kings and the Lord of lords inside of the person of Jesus and he didn't get all that. So the Bible says he made himself of no reputation and took upon the form of a servant, right? That's something powerful that men of God have to understand. It is not our job to be served. It is our job to serve. Now, that doesn't mean that there's a respect that's given, right? The Bible says, you know, give a, a, a prophet a glass of profit in the name of profit, and you will receive a prophet's reward. There's certain, that says, honor the man of God, right? It says, honor to whom honor is due, right? But at the end of the day, that does not negate the fact that we are still servants. People might bless me, but I'm still a servant. People might give me, but I'm still serving. People might do for me, but I'm still serving. And I'm going to serve until I die because my job is to serve the people of God. Not to be put on a pedestal by the people of God. Not to be, oh, I have to carry my briefcase and carry my stuff. And, you know, and I'm not knocking, I'm telling you that at the end of the day, for my walk in Christ, I'm going to be a servant leader. I'm going to give, I'm going to bless. I'm going to do what God called me to do, right? And so it says, and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion of a man, as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death. Isn't that powerful when, when God said that? And I think about this. Ain't no way in the world, if I was king of kings, I'd be, I'd be on this earth forever, honestly. I would not die. But Jesus decided that he was going to allow himself to walk in death. And not just any type of death. They beat him like a dog. He allowed that to happen in his life. Amen. So that God, we can be blessed. Amen. And so we are blessed only because. Amen. Amen. Like that. And so we're blessed because God has done his thing. Amen. And so it says in the fifth, I'm sorry, in the um, ninth verse, right? Wherefore God has highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name. But the thing is he had the mind, right? And so that's the mindset that we develop that we're not going to look like we're of a certain reputation, but we're going to have the mind of Christ. Now I want to do a, a scripture that God really wanted me to talk about today, right? We put on the helmet of salvation because the enemy wants to attack our minds. He, see, we live in an age of mental instability. We're living in an age where the enemy is attacking the mind. He's attacking people that's weak. He's attacking people that, you know, uh, uh, but he's attacking, right? And so you have to understand that the enemy is going to do everything in his power to grab you, to get you, to stop you, right? And so what you got to do is you got to do everything in your power to be the person that God calls you to be. Amen. And so I want you to turn to the book of 1 Kings, the 13th chapter. 1 Kings, the 13th chapter. All right, that's the Old Testament. 1 Kings, the 13th chapter. All right, so 1 Kings, the 13th chapter. I want to read this, and I want you to grab hold of this, and I think it's going to bless your life. Amen? It says, And behold, there came a man of God out of Judah, by the word of the Lord unto Bethel. And Jeroboam stood by the altar to burn incense. And he cried against the altar in the word of the Lord and said, O altar, altar, thus saith the Lord, behold, a child shall be born unto the house of David, Josiah by name, and upon thee shall he offer the priest of the high places that burn incense upon thee. 
and men's bones shall be burnt upon thee. And he gave a sign the same day, saying, This is the sign which the Lord has spoken. Behold, the altar shall be rent, and the ashes that are upon it shall be poured out. And it came to pass when the king Jeroboam right, heard this saying of the man of God, which had cried against the altar in Bethel, that he put forth his hand from the altar, saying, Lay hold on him. And his hand, which he put forth against him, dried up so that he could not pull it in again. Isn't that powerful? So he tried to go against the man of God, but in the midst of him going against the man of God, what God did in the midst of it is God dealt with that prophet. I mean, he dealt with that king. And so the prophet, God had given a word, and the prophet did this amazing thing, right? And so what happened is the altar also was rent, and the ashes poured out, just like the man of God said, right? According to the sign which the man of God had given by the word of the Lord. And the king answered and said unto the man of God, Entreat now the face of the Lord thy God, and pray for me, that my hand may be restored again. So all he's asking is, is man of God? Now I know you're a true man of God. Please now, I, I messed up, pray for me. And God had grace on the king. So here's what God did. It says, And the man of God besought the Lord, and the king's hand was restored from him again, and it became as it was before. And the king said unto the man of God, Come home with me and refresh thyself, and I will give thee a reward. So now the king said, I want to bless you. I apologize now, I want to bless you. But watch what happens. It says, And the man of God said unto the king, If thou wilt give me half thy house, I will not go in with thee. Neither will I eat bread nor drink water in this place. He was talking tough to the king. I ain't doing nothing, you say, king. Right? Then it says, For so was it charged by me, by the word of the Lord, saying, Eat no bread, nor drink water, nor turn again by the same way that thou camest. So he went another way and returned not by the way he came to Bethel. Now there dwelt an old prophet, in Bethel. And his sons came and told him all the works that the man of God had done that day in Bethel. The words which he had spoken unto the king, them they told also to their father. And their father said unto them, What way went he? For his sons had seen that way that the man of God went, which came from Judah. And he said unto his sons, Saddle me the ass. And they saddled him the ass, and he rolled thereon, and went after the man of God, and found him sitting under an oak, and said unto him, Art thou the man of God that came from Judah? And he said, I am. And he said unto him, Come home with me and eat bread. Now remember what the man of God said. He said that God has spoken to him and let him know. Can I tell you when God speaks to the people of God, somebody else and sometimes the word comes from people in the church will come against that individual, will come against that mindset, will come against, hey, I'm totally sold out to do what God called me to do. You know, it's amazing. You know, a person sold out to do, it's like, it don't take all that. You ain't got to do all that. You know what I mean? You, you, you don't have to live that saved. Well, sometimes they take all that and some more. But if God said it, that's what we're doing. We can't change the word of God. That's not our, uh, that's not our God given right. That's not what God gave us. God told us to obey the word. And so this young man, right, his mindset was to obey the word. But now this prophet comes and tells him something different. He said unto him, come home with me and eat bread. And he said, I may not return with thee, nor go with thee. Neither will I eat bread nor drink water with thee in this place. For it was said to me by the word of the Lord, thou shalt eat no bread, nor drink water there, nor return again to go the way that thou camest. And he said to him, I'm a prophet also. And an angel of the Lord spoke to me by the word of the Lord, saying, bring them back with thee unto thine house, that thou may eat bread and drink water. But he lied unto him. So he went back with them and, and did eat bread in the house and drank water. Let me tell you something. I don't care how you feel. I don't care how hungry you are. If God told you not to eat, don't eat. 
I don't care how crazy it is or how bad it is. Whatever the word of God says, that's what we got to stand by. I know it's rough. I know it's tough. But you got to stand for the word of God. Because if you don't, then you're going to be subject to other elements and other things. And now you're not protected by God. This man was bold. And he was able to say to the king some stuff. But now he's gonna, he, can't, he can't walk in boldness anymore because he's not walking in righteousness. That's why a lot of people give up space in church because they're not walking in righteousness. So they're scared to stand up for the truth. They're scared to stand up for what God said because they know that they said some stuff and they did some stuff that was against what God said. So now it is not time to fall to that. It's time to get back up and let God forgive me and get it right. Amen. Now, but this young man, he's in a predicament. Said this, he told him all this stuff, right? So I went back to him and ate bread and drank water in his house. And it came to pass that they sat at the table that the word. Now this man might give that first word he did was a lie. He lied to the man of God. And so the man of God is changing his mind, right? And so the enemy will lie to us. And he will use anybody he needs to to lie to us. To get us to get outside of God's word. Can I preach to you right now? And that's why you got to put on the helmet of salvation. Because if you don't put on the helmet of salvation, the enemy will do whatever it takes to take your mind. If he don't take your mind by, by per persuading you to do something outside the will of God, he'll take your mind by giving you all kind of stress and all kind of mess in your life. And to the point where you just scream and pull your hair out because now it's affecting your mind. He's trying to mess with your mind. Now it's time to change our minds. He's trying to change our minds, right? And it came to pass that he sat on the table that the word of the Lord came unto the prophet that brought him back. And he cried unto the man of God that came from Judah, saying, Thus saith the Lord, For as much as thou hast disobeyed the mouth of the Lord and hast not kept the commandment which the Lord had commanded thee, but comest back, thou hast eaten bread and drunk water in the place of which the Lord did say to thee, eat no bread and drink no water, thou carcass shall not come to the sepulchre of thy fathers. Hmm. Basically, he's telling the young man that he's going to die. And if you keep reading this chapter, you, you will finally figure out that the man of God, the prophet that did all those great works, that did all those good things, he eventually went down in death because he did not follow God's word. Can I preach to you and persuade you? Hey, we're fighting this fight. We're fighting this fight of faith. Do not, because you've done all kinds of great things. If you're a man of God, if you're a woman of God, if you're out there knowing that you've done great things in God. Hey, just because you've done great things in the past does not mean it's going to take you to the future. you got to continually do the word of God. you got to continually make choices to walk in the way of God. Don't you understand? People always say that salvation keeps you. Once you're saved, you're always going to be saved. But the Bible talks about backsliding. And the Bible talks about backsliding that the enemy can't take your salvation. Nothing can take your salvation. People can't take your salvation. But you have a choice in and of yourself. And you can walk right out of your salvation. That's why I call backsliding. I told somebody, do you understand the process of backsliding got to be difficult? I look at salvation like climbing up and making a decision. Now you slide into salvation. And the only people that go up slides backwards is bad kids. You got those bad, you know, those kids, they, they just say, we, we're not going to just do everybody. We're going we to walk up the slide backwards. And so they go up the slide backwards. And I tell somebody, if you ever backslide, don't trip, just slide back. It ain't hard to slide back because God's way is easy. His yoke is easy. His burdens are light. All you got to do is make a decision. And when you make that decision, the angels start um, um, blessing you. That's the time when Jesus was praying, sweat, great drops of blood, amen? And the Bible says, he said, nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. As soon as he said that, the Bible says, angels came and ministered unto him. The angels didn't minister unto him until he made a decision, a nevertheless type of decision. There was some Peter. Peter was getting ready to, 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 to do something on the boat, right? And they were getting ready to fish. And they said, nevertheless, at your word, we're going to go out. And when they did a nevertheless, they, God went out there and they caught a big round of fish. Why? Because they decided that they were going to do God's will nevertheless. Now, God can do a miracle. A lot of people haven't gotten to the place or the point that they have gotten to the place that they're going to say nevertheless. 
If you can get to the place where you start saying, nevertheless, watch God begin to move in your life. Watch the blessings of God begin to, come, begin to move in your life. Because you've gotten to a point where you say, God, nevertheless. Now, I know it's crazy, but nevertheless, at your word. Now, I know it's rough, but nevertheless, at your word, I'm going to do it. And the last thing I want to talk about tonight is the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. The sword of the spirit is powerful, right? The Bible says that, that the word is powerful as a two-edged sword, slicing, right? Our problem is we, 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 we've not handled the word correctly. And we've been cutting people and slicing people up and, and hurting people because we haven't handled the word, right? It's, 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 it's a very precious tool. It, you know, you can't just talk the word any kind of way. You've got to handle it and you've got to make sure you're speaking it from God's direction. Yeah, yeah, well, we all got the word. We all can read the word. We all know the word. But you have to handle the word with care. When you go in places, handle the word with care. When you, when you walk into places, handle the word with care. Hey, when you're in church, handle the word with care. And watch what God do. God going to move in your life. God going to do some stuff. God got works. He got all kind of stuff for you. I just wanted you to get this word tonight. I wanted you to just... Understand that God can do exceeding and abundantly. But the biggest part is that we don't fight with our hands. We don't fight with our mouths. We fight with the weapons that God has given us. I pray that this series has blessed you. I pray that these series of lessons have, have captured your attention to the point where you will never again fight with your fist, fight with your mouth, fight with your pen, but you will fight out of the direction of God, under the leadership of God, hearing the word of God, making sure we're in line with God and doing it God's way. Every time it get crazy, I got to praise. Every time it get messed up, I got a blessing. Every time it get messed up, I know how to pray. Every time it get real, real bad, I know how to fast. Every time I, I need something, I know how to go into the word. Every time I just walk in my breastplate of righteousness, I, I start walking in truth, amen. I start walking the way that God walk, told me to walk. I start walking in faith, not in sight. I start doing what God called me to do. Yes. I start being who God called me to be. And I just thank God for all that he's done, all that he's doing, all that he's going to do in your life. And I'm so excited about your next. Can I preach to you? I am excited about your next. See, you're stuck in your now. Some people can't move because they're stuck in their now. But I don't want you to, I want you to understand that your now is not going to always be. The, the place that it is now is the place that they're going to be was, right? Used to be back in the day. Right? You got to learn how to move on from your now. The devil wants to get us captured and stuck into right now. If something happened bad, he want to get us stuck right there. Something happened good, he want to get us stuck right there. Don't you understand that if something happened good, something can happen better, you still got to move on. If something happened bad, don't you get stuck there. You move on and you say, God, I've got it. Hey, hey, if it was that bad, it got to be better next. Amen? So now I'm waiting and I'm excited about my next. Because God going to do some stuff. Right now, we're getting ready to move. We were in Land of Lakes. We were there. We were faithful. We were doing what God called us to do. We, we did it. But now we're moving into Wesley Chapel. And I can feel a, a, a wave that's about to happen. I feel that people are about to come. I feel that, you know what I mean? God is really about to increase the ministry. I was walking in the gym. And God has spoken to my heart that we're not going to just have service in the place that we're having service, but we're going to have to move out to the old gym. I mean, we're going to have to put those 200 chairs out there and we're going to have to utilize those 200 and we may have to buy some more chairs because God is going to increase the ministry. And so I'm excited about it and I pray that you become excited about it and I pray that we really go and do what God called us to do. I'm so excited about moving into this area, Wesley Chapel. We're about to march in. We're not, we're not coming in and play. We're coming in strong, amen? And I'm coming in. I'm inviting people to church. I'm telling people about God. I'm witnessing the individuals. I'm going door to door, putting door tags on, letting them know that we are here. We are here to stay. We're here because God called us here, and we're going to be a blessing to this community. Amen. Jesus. 
we was looking, and it's like, seemed like it's not a whole bunch of room in Wesley Chapel. But it seemed like it's growing so fast that it's hard to get a space and all this good stuff. But I'm going to tell you something. We got a purpose here, so God is going to have a place for us. We're going to be here because God called us to be here. I'm going to tell you something. In your life, you got to understand, if God called me to do something, it's going to happen. I don't know how. I don't know when. I can't explain. But I'm telling you, it's about to happen. Why? Because God spoke. And see, the man of God had to understand that if God said, it. I got to settle with that. I don't care what the prophet said. The prophet done told him a lie. So many times in our life, people tell us lies. They tell us something against what God told us. And sometimes we have an audacity to believe it. When we believe what God did not say in our life, it causes our mission to die. It causes our vision to die. And the man of God died a nasty death on the side of the road. Because he decided to listen to a prophet over God. I love y'all. But I'm going to tell you, you got to have a relationship with God. That's my whole job is to, is to, is to uh, um, preach you into a relationship with God. It's to teach you into a relationship with God. But my, my thing is not for you to honor me greater and more than you honor God. My whole thing is that you begin to hear God for yourself. It's, uh, it's, I'm the outer voice that's speaking to your inner voice so that you can begin to hear God that's on the inside of you. The Bible said, greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. God on the inside is saying, I want to speak and I want to guide your life. I want to direct your life. And the only the only way I can do that is you got to hear me. And so I'm praying and I'm preaching and I'm teaching so that you can begin to hear God for yourself so that you're never in a position like the young prophet that you're listening to everybody else. Sometimes we sit up there trying to get counsel from everybody else and God's trying to be the one counseling us. Woo! Yeah, yeah. We trying to hear what everybody else got to say but God trying to talk to us. Woo! We, we trying to, you know what I mean, read all these books and read all this stuff outside of the word. Come on now. At the end of the day, DJ is awesome and, and all these other people are awesome and these books are cool and this stuff is great. But if you don't get a word for yourself, you might be in the same spot that the other prophet was in. Hearing somebody and letting them lead you in a, a place that's not God. There's this church and this pastor came up and he said God had told him some stuff. And he did, that did not agree with those people. When those people left that church in droves. Why? Because you got to know when, when to leave a shepherd. You know what I mean? It's times where I ain't saying that, you know, a lot of folks just leave church for any reason. For, for no reason at all. They just don't like it. They feel a certain way. They want to leave the church. But if your pastor is out of God's will and God say move, it's time to move. If I'm out of God's will... Y'all don't listen to me if I'm going crazy. I'm, I'm talking stuff that ain't in the Word. I can't back what I'm talking about in the Word. Everything we talk about with this spiritual warfare, we backed it up in the Word. Everything I talk about on Sunday, we back it up in the Word. Why? Because the Word is our foundation. That is our foundation. And that's what we're going to stand on. That's why Bible study is so important. Word, word. And I'm praying that we get to a point where y'all start asking questions so that we can we can really be integrated. That's why I can't wait until we uh, uh, get into our own facility and we can just get in there and we can just be intimate inside of the Bible study. And, and I'm not that type of person that says you can't ask questions because I'm, I'm scared what might happen. Hey, I, that's what we got the Holy Ghost for. You know what I mean? That's why the Bible said no weapon formed against me shall prosper. I'm not worried about anything. I just know that God is going to do exceeding abundantly and above. So again, this Sunday is going to be our first Sunday that we're going to be in Wesley Chapel. We've been here before. We kind of touched base and we touched down and, and we went there for a service, but we are coming.